And what I want to show you is that antimatter is in fact one of the biggest mysteries in science today. In short, I want to show you why antimatter matters. But first of all, some background, so you can place antimatter in context in our wider understanding of the universe. I'm a particle physicist, and the aim of my area of science is to understand the universe through understanding its structure, what it's made of at the very smallest levels. Because our idea is if we can understand what holds the universe together and how it behaves here at the tiniest scales, we can understand how to understand it at much larger everyday and beyond scales. Now, you might already know that everything you see around you is made of atoms of different types, but what we discovered in science is that if you can look deeper and see that atoms themselves are made of even smaller elements, and the smallest elements of all, which are at least as small compared to atoms as atoms are compared to you, are fundamental particles. And in my science, this is what we study. And what we found amazingly in all of our experiments is that everything we've seen around us is ultimately made of vast collections of a very small number of these very tiny objects. There's only 12 of them, six different types of fundamental particles we call quarks, six different types we call leptons. And these are bound together by just four different types of forces that are responsible for all the different structures and textures we see around us and that we feel. Now, that's not quite all there is in the universe, because each of these tiny matter objects also has an antimatter counterpart, a type of particle that has the opposite charge to its matter counterpart, that behaves like a type of mirror motion to that matter counterpart. And we describe these particles, these antiparticles, and the forces that bind them together in mathematics, in equations. And these equations form our theory of particle physics. And our theory is what we test in experiments to see how good our understanding of the universe is. Now, this theory and our understanding have really developed over hundreds and hundreds of years through looking at patterns in nature for a behavior that seems to be repeated again and again and again. We're looking at symmetries and adopting symmetry principles in the way we understand the universe. And when I say symmetries here, I'm not talking about proportions or ratios or, or beauty, even though we think our equations are beautiful. I'm talking about a very general type of symmetry, a feature or a behavior that doesn't change, no matter how or where or when we look at it. Because if we can identify this, we can come up with laws of nature that describe that behavior that we know will be the same and apply in the same way wherever in the universe you are, at whatever time in the universe you are. It's an approach that's been really successful for us in understanding the fundamental universe, and it's revealed the inner simplicity of the universe as well to us. Now, I mean, scientists are not the only people to be attracted by simplicity and by symmetries and structures and use it in their work. Very appropriately, because we're here today, Bach is an example of somebody who was also attracted by patterns, by symmetries, and used them in his composition. And what's really remarkable to me is that some of these mathematical patterns that Bach adopts in his lines of music are really good analogs for the ways in which in our theory we describe the behavior of this very fundamental universe. Now I'm going to give you three examples of the patterns that Bach uses, and I'm going to show you what they correspond to in particle physics. And I want to do this because Firstly, the similarities I hope you'll see, and I hope you're not going to be too disgusted by, is that the similarities are so striking, but they're also going to give us some insight into antimatter and its symmetry as well. So I'm going to illustrate each of these three patterns by a very short piece of music, just, just for notes, the notes that spell Bach's name. Now, the first mathematical pattern that I want to talk about, that Bach adopts sometimes, is a reflection in time, where Bach takes a phrase and then turns it backwards. 
so that the last note comes first and the first note comes last. Now, in the maths that we use to describe fundamental particle physics, this is exactly the same operation that we use. And what's more, it hides a symmetry. If you reflect this music twice, once that way, once that way, you end up back where you started. And the same applies in particle physics too. If you move a particle forward in time and backward in time, you stay in the present. Nothing's changed. There is a symmetry of behavior. Now, as well as reflecting notes in time, Bach also reflected notes in space. Vertically, on the y-axis, if you like. If you can imagine a mirror, which is along the middle line of that piece of music, along the line that corresponds to the note B. If I reflect my notes about that line, then the first note, B flat, which is one note below, goes to C, one note above. And A, which is two notes below, goes to D flat, two notes above. The C, which is one note above, goes to B flat, one note below, and then B natural stays where it is because it's on the line that I'm reflecting back. Bach uses this. But in particle physics, we use it too because this is the type of way in our mathematics we denote a particle's parity, the property of behaving like a mirror image of itself which is very important when we describe its behavior with one of the fundamental forces. And again, it hides a symmetry. Because you reflect these notes twice, upwards and backwards, you get back to where you started. And for our particles, if you change their parity once, twice, you end up with the same particle. Now, it's not just reflections. Bach also has rotations. So this is a bit of a stretch now. But if in your imagination, you can imagine turning these notes round by 180 degrees so that they end up upside down and back to front, like so. This is an analog for changing a particle's charge in our mathematical description. You rate, you rotate once, you change a charge from being negative to positive. Rotate again, you go from being positive back to negative. In the same way that if you rotate these notes twice, you end up back where you started. Now that's all great, but what's also very interesting is that you can do these three operations, which are called C, P, and T, in any order whatsoever in this, with this piece of music, and you always end up back where you started. I think this might have been a symmetry that even escaped Bach. I haven't found this in any of his work. And if you're worried by that statement, I improved it behind me, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> but what's fascinating for me is that we think this CPT operation is also a fundamental symmetry in particle physics. We have a theorem that states if you take a particle, you change its charge, its parity, its time, you will end up with a particle behaving in exactly the same way as before. We think it's one of the most fundamental symmetries in particle physics behavior that we've come across. We haven't found any experimental evidence to the contrary, which amazes me, because by adopting the, a very similar outlook, looking for patterns, using symmetries in our respective frameworks, Bach in music and particle physicists in science have managed to answer and address very, very different questions, but using very similar tools. It, it is quite amazing. Now, you might be wondering how this relates to antimatter, so let me get back to the talk. So, if I want to change a particle to its antiparticle version, I have to change its charge and its parity, C and P. Now, if I have a piece of music where I change C and P, then generally speaking, I am not going to end up back where I started. It is not a symmetry in music. But for many, many years, people thought that this was a symmetry in nature, and that particles and antiparticles would therefore behave identically to each other. It wasn't until the 1960s that we found experimental evidence that that was almost, almost, but not quite the case. Antimatter is not quite the same as normal matter. The symmetry that we were assuming up to then is imperfect. <coughs> but it turns out that that imperfection in the symmetry has amazing consequences for our understanding of the universe. Now, matter and antimatter might be pretty similar, but we know when we have them together because they tend to annihilate each other very efficiently. 
So if I have a quarter of a gram of matter meeting a quarter of a gram of antimatter, the resulting explosion has the force of five kilotons of TNT. It is quite noticeable in the diagnostic. But, but you don't see it happening on Earth. You don't see it happening in space. And that's because antimatter is incredibly rare. And that rarity is puzzling to us. Because at the very start of the universe, at the time of the Big Bang, we think that half the universe was made of matter, half antimatter, and that particles would meet antiparticles and violate, and these explosions would create more particles and antiparticles. And this process continued as the universe expanded until less than a second after the Big Bang, the universe had expanded and cooled down so much that there was no longer enough energy in these explosions to create more particles and antiparticles, and that whole process stopped. And what remains now in the universe, what we're all made of, is formed of the leftovers of those last annihilations. And the fact that we're here, made of matter, means that there must have been very slightly more matter than antimatter at that very early point in the universe. Very slightly more, no more than one part in a billion. That can only happen if there's something a little bit different about antimatter. Perhaps it decays more quickly than matter, and that's why there's a little bit less of it. But that difference is why we're here. Because if matter and antimatter were identical, if that symmetry were exact, it would all have cancelled out back then, and the universe now would just be full of light. There'd be no stars, no planets, no life at all. So the fact that we're here, the fact that the universe looks the way it does to us, is thanks in part to this imperfection in our understanding of antimatter. And that's why we really want to understand it. Now, unfortunately, our theory has no idea at all why antimatter should be that little bit different. In fact, it predicts that antimatter and matter should be identical. So this is a question we have to investigate with experiments to try and make as many measurements of matter and antimatter as we can, and then to try and piece them together to see the connections and get an understanding that way. I work on one of these experiments. It's an experiment at CERN, the European Centre for Particle Physics. It's an experiment at CERN's Large Hadron Collider Particle Accelerator, LHC for short. And I have a picture of my experiment behind me. It's 20 metres long, 10 metres high, and it is hidden by lots of scaffolding. You'll have to take my word for it that there is a really high-tech piece of equipment behind there. Now, when the LHC operates, it sends two beams of protons, hydrogen nuclei, at almost light speed around its circular circumference. And it collides these beams inside this experiment 40 million times a second. And in every collision, for a tiny moment of time, in that tiny area of space, each collision creates particles and antiparticles that fly out into our experiment, slowing down, decaying to other stuff, losing their energy as they go. And my experiment acts as a camera that records this energy that's deposited. And then physicists like me analyze this data identify the types of particles that we think are there, and then count how many of them are made of matter, how many of them are made of antimatter. And so far we've made many measurements of matter and antimatter through studying different types of particles. And what's compelling is that in every case we see a difference between matter and antimatter. And what's even more exciting is that the difference we see, the underlying difference, is the same for everything we've looked at in this experiment and ones that came before it. And that's exciting, because even if we don't really understand what makes antimatter that little bit different and that breaks its symmetry, perhaps these results are giving us a clue. Well, we can put these results in context and see how well we're doing. We can take the difference we've seen between matter and antimatter and relate it back to how much antimatter that implies there should have been at the start of the universe. And if we do that, we don't find half the universe's worth of antimatter like we were expecting. In fact, we only find about a galaxy's worth of antimatter. It's much, much too small. 
The difference that we've seen is far too small to explain the mystery of antimatter for us. So I have to say, after many decades of experimental effort, antimatter is still very much a mystery to us. But we hope it's not going to be a mystery for much longer. Because my experiment is just a fraction of the way through its ultimate data set. There are other experiments at CERN, elsewhere in the world, even out in space, that make measurements of antimatter in different regimes and in different ways. They're all sending in data at the moment. We're all analyzing that data at the moment. We think now that perhaps the answer to this mystery lies in new physics phenomena that we haven't yet discovered, but which could hold the key. And we hope very much that we can discover some evidence of that in the next few years, and then finally, finally, restore this broken symmetry of antimatter again, and understand the universe in its infinities that much better. <laughs>